Jesus, we thank you that we can see and can ask that Christ be magnified in us because of, of who Jesus is, that he is our Lord and he is our Savior. Uh, we thank you for that, and we thank you for this opportunity to be here and to worship you and to hear your word this morning. So I ask that you would be with Gustavo as he uh, brings that this morning, that you would speak through him and that you would open our hearts to be uh, ready and receptive to hear your teaching. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to welcome you again to Harvester. Uh, I'm so glad you're with us today. We're going to continue our series called Meltdown. And we're looking at men and women of faith that had a, a meltdown point in their lives. And a meltdown is whenever you uh, are caused by life circumstances to question what you believe in. Today I wanted to do something different. I wanted you to experience just really uh, the message in a different way. And so I'm going to invite you to just open your containers that you received. By the way, if you don't have a container, just raise your hand. And if the ushers can help us pass those out, uh, just uh, you'll receive one. So we're going to need them throughout. Now, when you open the container, there is a smell. It smells like coffee and chocolate, if you, if you can smell that. And so you're welcome. Um, if you saw people jittering on the way out for, from first service... You know now what was happening. Um, but here's what I, I want to do today. I want you to know the life is very much like this container right here, right? It has sweet moments, and it has some moments that may not be so sweet, that can be better. In fact, uh, I don't know if you remember your life as a kid, but, you know, it's, it's amazing because I remember thinking that the smallest things make you laugh. You, know, you get so excited about things that are quite simple. And I kind of miss some of those times, right? When life just seemed so pleasant and it was full of hopes and dreams. I remember, you know, just wanting to take on the world as a, as a young man. And maybe many of you have experienced exactly what I'm thinking. And, and we have dreams and hopes. But as you go along, you realize that not all of life is that way. In fact, some of you may have experienced that from a very young age where you, you also encounter suffering and pain in uncomfortable moments, in painful moments. And so in life, we get both of them, right? We get some sweet moments and some bitter moments. And the question is, why can't we just have the chocolate? Why can't we just have sweet moments all the time in life? If God is good and if he is so powerful, why can't we just have, you know, good moments all the time? The, in other words, why do bad things happen? That is a question. Today we're going to talk about a lady in scripture. Her name is Naomi. Say with me, Naomi. Naomi means pleasant. She was a pleasant lady. That it was a, she was a sweet lady that suffered some devastating losses in her life that turned her life, in a, in a, a life into a life of grief, of suffering. And so let's open our Bibles in the book of Ruth. Book of Ruth, chapter 1. And we're going to, to just explore this book uh, it's a short book. It has four chapters only, and it's going to tell us the story of, of two women, and we're going to focus on Naomi, but really uh, it's, it's the story of two women. And so if you have your, uh, your Bibles with you, just please open them in Ruth chapter 1. And here's what it says. I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was the other Ruth. They lived there about uh, ten years. Both Malan and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. And so we find that this sweet lady, this pleasant lady Naomi, goes through a lot of suffering. And, and I just want to go back because I think that we are all susceptible to suffering. In fact, you know, Ruth, um, I mean, Naomi and her husband Elimelech, they're just a family like any other family, right? They have hopes, they have dreams, they have good times. And all of a sudden, 
A famine strikes the land, strikes the house of bread. They, the Bible says that they, they lived in Bethlehem. The word Bethlehem means house of bread. In other words, Bethlehem was the bread basket of Israel. It's the place where things grew. And, and, and all of a sudden, they find that they have no food. And so they moved with their two sons to Moab. Now, before we go there, the Bible tells us the name of their two sons. Now, they were Malon and Kilion. And in, our, you know, in, our, in the English language, that doesn't sound so bad. They, they actually sound kind of cool. How many of you ever thought, man, I wish my parents would have named me something different? You know, okay, a couple of you, good. Like for me, Gustavo, right, in the United States, it's not so easy to say, you know, or to spell. People misspell my, my name all the time and miss, you know, they, they don't say it right. Sometimes they call me Gustav. Sometimes they call me Gustapo. Sometimes <laughs> they call me Gustavo, you know, Gusto, different names, and that's okay. I've gotten used to it. So that's why usually if I introduce myself to people, I say, I'm Gus. That's a lot easier to remember. But, you know, if, if you have ever complained about your name, you have nothing to complain about because I'm going to tell you what the, the meaning of these two sons' names are. One was called Malon, which means sickly. Okay, so how bad did the kid look that when he came out of the womb, they're like, oh, you, you're sickly, and that's going to be your name, right? And then the other ones, it's even worse. It's Killian means weakling, weakling. It's like the kid lays on a pillow, hurts his neck, right? So if you are interested in these names, go for it. Use them to, to your heart's content. But here's the thing. Something was going on with this family. And early on, they started to experience challenges. And I tell you what, it gets worse. So the Bible says that they moved to the land of Moab. Now, why is this significant? Because Moab was an enemy of Israel. In fact, uh, during the time of Moses, they tried to curse Israel. The Moabites tried to hire a prophet to curse Israel, but God turned it around and instead of bless, bless them. But because of that, in Deuteronomy 23, we, we see that God says that no Moabites can join the worship assembly because they tried to curse the nation that God was trying to bless. And in fact, this is they, they shouldn't go hang out with them. And during this time of the judges, the Moabites conquered Israel for about 18 years. So there's rivalry. They're just across the Jordan River on the east, and the Israelites are on the west, and there's rivalry there. But I tell you what, for a family who is needing food during the time of famine, Moab seemed like a place to go. Here's the problem. As soon as they're getting there and settled, the husband dies. Now I want you to think about Naomi. How many of you have ever done something that is wrong, and then something backfires. What, do you, what is your first thought? Mm, God is punishing me. God must be mad at me. God, not, you know, I did something I should, I should have done, and now God is getting back at me. Now, can you imagine Naomi kind of feeling this tension? Finally, her two sons, sickly and wickling, finally die. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, we don't know what happened, but they died. And... And now she's found by herself with her two daughters-in-law, just without any help. Now, why is this important? We need to understand that in biblical times, women depended on a male relative for their economic and social security. In other words, it doesn't mean that they didn't do anything. In fact, we see Proverbs 31, right? The, uh, The women were in charge of the household. They were hard workers. However, for them to do transactions in society, they needed a male relative, either a father or a husband or a son, that would, you know, serve for them as protectors. And so now both Naomi and Orpah and Ruth were left unprotected without uh, their husbands. And so here's what we, we're asking, right? So why do bad things happen to good people? So now I want you to just take one of the chocolate pieces that you have and just eat it. Just one, though. How many of you already ate the whole thing? Just be honest. <laughs> like, someone's like, uh, we were supposed to wait. Just eat one. And I tell you what, life can be like this, right? One moment, it can be sweet. And you think that you're on top of the world, but things can change so quickly. When God created the world in Genesis 1, he gave us a perfect creation. Adam and Eve didn't have to work to get food 
they just obtained it. They, get to, they got to, to spend time with God one-on-one. But then sin enters the world, and God's perfect creation falls. It gets broken. It becomes imperfect. And we hear right away, when God finds out that Adam and, sin, and Eve had sin, he tells them, Eve, right away, hey, from now on, there's going to be some consequences. Number one, you're going to have to suffer to give birth. So life is now going to be a struggle just to provide, to procreate, to, to have life. And then he turns around and tells Adam, you're going to have to work. There are going to be thorns and thistles because of you creation. The creation, you know, is now under a curse. And things start, bad things start happening. And we see that even today. And so why do bad things happen? Because we live in a, in a creation broken by sin in a sinful and fallen world. And so grief is going to come as a result of that fallen and sinful world. Grief comes as a result of of the fact that now God's creation is imperfect. And in fact, we're not the only ones that experience that loss. Creation itself, the Apostle Paul says, experiences it. Turn over to Romans chapter 8, verses 19 to 21. It says, For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. That means creation is waiting for Jesus to come back so that we can be revealed as as the the kingdom of God. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. And hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay. So right now, everything in creation tends to decay. Things go wrong and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. But one day, God is going to restore creation away uh, again. And so here's what we experience. We experience the result, the grief, the suffering, the pain that we experience in the world. Is, uh, it has different sources. One, we can see from the very beginning there was an enemy, Satan. Satan still attacks people. There's, the Bible talks about a spiritual battle that is fighting for our souls, and sometimes you may experience attacks from the enemy. The Bible also talks about just creation being, you know, just broken in a sense. It's not perfect anymore, and, it's, and that's what we, why we experience earthquakes and tornadoes and tsunamis and all kinds of things that sometimes end up hurting or killing people. It also, we are also sometimes experiencing suffering and pain from the sin of other people. You know, how many of us have experienced hurts by others? Sometimes children experience hurt by others. And, and it's difficult to, to understand that, why people do that. But be, we live in a, in a world influenced by sin. You know, we call greed in our society, we call greed, you know, high aspirations. We call sexual sin liberation. We call hatred justice at times. And even Christians sometimes can turn a blind eye to these things. And sometimes, you know, we are hurt by our own sin. Our own decisions bring pain onto our life. So grief and pain is something that we're bound to experience, every single person. But the question is, what do we do when we experience the bitterness of grief and suffering? So what I want you to do is take a couple of the, the coffee beans, and I want you to just, you know, eat them. And I know we have some of you coffee lovers that are like, oh, this is great. But for most of us normal people, it's bitter, right? It's not something that's so enjoyable. <clears throat> coffee keeps trying to choke me every time I... Um, a better question to ask maybe is, what do we do when we experience grief and bitterness and in our lives. Uh, maybe for most of us, we have a tendency to unravel and go to places where we maybe change our perspective of God. And that's exactly what happened to Naomi, this sweet lady. And here's what happens. Bitterness happens when we feel abandoned and hurt by God. We, there's a point, and this is the, the interesting thing about suffering. It can make, change your perspective. It can tent everything else in a way that all of a sudden you feel lonely, you feel abandoned, you feel hurt. And when, that, when you blame God because of that, you're in a different place. Let's uh, read verses 12 and 13. 
So here's what happens. Now that they're unprotected, uh, Naomi is trying to figure out, what do I do next? So she thinks, I need to go back home. And her daughters-in-law want to go back with her, but she urges, this, urges them to get back home. Uh, verse 12 says this, Return home, my daughters, to, the, to their Moabite families. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. See how she starts to get this tainted picture of God. That now God is against her. And I mean, you know, you can kind of see how she got there, right? So they go, they leave the land of Israel, they go to a prohibited land, they marry those people, and all of a sudden things are going bad, you're going to think God is punishing me. And many of us have that picture of God. You know, many of us live with that God that is like waiting to judge you, waiting to, to punish you. And if that's your view of God, I'm telling you, you are tempted to go into a better state, into a better type of grief, and that's not a good place to be. And let's see what happens next. We're going to see that one of the, the daughters-in-law returns home, but one stays. And we're going to talk about that in a second. But I want you to see the reaction of the people when they see Naomi. Jump over to verse 19 with me. So when Ruth and Naomi go back to, to, to Bethlehem, uh, it says in verse 19, So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? I don't know what happened to Naomi. Uh, all I know is that, have you ever looked at pictures of people that you knew in high school, and now you're looking at them, and you're like, whoa, life hasn't been so kind to you, <laughs> right? And if you, you know, people are maybe saying that about us, right? Let's be honest. But if that's happened to you, that's probably what happened to Naomi. It's like, can you imagine her and, and Elimelech and her two sons, as sickly as they were, they, they left, and they were like a family full of hopes and dreams. And now the sons are dead, the husband's dead, and she comes back with just one daughter-in-law. And she, her face probably looks sad. Maybe she's skin and bones from not being able to eat, you know, because they can't provide for themselves just on their own. And so they're hoping to come back, and they're hoping that they can survive at least. Their hopes have turned just into survival and so Naomi turns around, verse 20, and says, don't call me Naomi. Don't call me pleasant. Don't call me sweet anymore. She told him, call me Mara. You know what Mara means? Bitter. Call me bitter. Because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord, she's blaming God, the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. I mean, that is a tough place to be. That's the point of meltdown right here. This is the meltdown point. When you have turned, you blame God, it's affected your relationship with God, you, you don't see anything but the affliction that is in front of you, the pain, the suffering, life starts to taste bitter, everything around you is hopeless, you don't laugh anymore, you don't see hope, you don't get excited, you are simply just mad and distant from the Lord. And if you've been in that spot, you're not alone. Naomi is there right there, right now. And so here's, here's the problem. If you're a parent, here's what you know that maybe you used to not know, but as a parent you do. And I want you to think about God as our Heavenly Father. Anything that you do, and this is what I tell my kids at times when they get mad for you know, us saying or doing something. It's like, listen, I'm for you. I'm always for you. Like, I gain nothing in disciplining you, like, right? Um, and so I need you to understand that I'm for you. And you parents understand that. And if we, who are flawed human beings, can do that, imagine our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father is telling you, I am for you. I am with you. I'm cheering for you, and I want what's best for you, even if life at times tastes a little bit bitter. Even if you go through painful and difficult situations, I am with you and I'm for you. And I'm letting you go for, through that for a reason. And when we misconstrue God's intentions like Naomi did and get mad at God, the enemy is rejoicing because he's done his job. 
So the question may be for some of you, can I come back from bitterness? Can I have this type of grief that is so deeply in, you know, just entrenched in my soul that I can come back from it? Well, I tell you what, I love the book of Ruth because it shows us that God is so good that he brings Naomi back from her grief and her bitterness into a state that is completely different, realizing that God was with her the whole time. And so you are never too far gone. These are good news for us because God redeems us from bitter grief through different ways. And we see it in this book in three different ways, I believe. The first one is that he shows us his love through stubborn, the stubborn love of others. You know, some of us can be hard to love. Naomi was one of them. And God used Ruth to bring Naomi back from her grief. Uh, let's read verses one, uh, chapter 1, verse 15. Here's where it says, Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me ever so severely if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. We need to be people that love others with stubborn love. You know, in our culture, we are so afraid of rejection that sometimes you offer a hand to someone, and the first time that they say no or no thanks, you're like, okay, you know, I wanted to help you, but okay, I'm, I'm moving on to someone else. And I told you what, I think we need to be a little more stubborn at times loving people. We need to show them that we care. We need to not be afraid of the first negative reaction that they have toward us. I tell you, sometimes there are people, if you are like me, we can be a little bit hard to love. One of the downsides of being in ministry is that um, I feel like it's difficult for me to accept help. Like we are in a position where I get to see people, you know, receiving God's blessings and being a part of that. But it's hard for us to receive help. And I want to brag on you, church. In 2022, uh, we, my, my mom died and it was a difficult moment. It was a moment of those bitter moments, right, in life. A moment of grief. And I remember our churches gather around us uh, 100%. I remember a friend that came to the house and just didn't say much he just hugged me and that's it and I'm you know if you know me I'm Hispanic but I'm not that you know huggy touchy feel too much especially with guys and it's just like hey but he just embraced me and hugged me and that's what I needed at the moment and then um, we had to you know travel to the funeral and you know so, some of you just so generously gave to our family that I, I literally told a couple of you, I said, hey, I can't take this from your family. And one of, one of, one of you said, uh, you're my family. Then on the way there, um, our, our SUV transmission went out. And uh, we were found, you know, in, in Texas, and we, we got to the funeral, but I remember there were a couple of you that said, we'll go get your vehicle from Texas, and they were ready to do it. And there were then notes and meals and uh, just words of love and appreciation. And I'll tell you what, during those bitter moments of life, the love, the stubborn love of others just really helps you be able to swallow the bitterness in your life so that it doesn't stay in, uh, the flavor doesn't stay in your mouth, in your life. And so the stubborn love of others is how God got Naomi through this time of pain and bitterness. You know what the, the name Ruth means? Friendship. Ruth learned to be a good friend to Naomi. And she knew the God of Israel. She found the God of Israel and decided to stay with that God and with her friend Naomi. But here's the second way in which God, what God uh, redeemed us from from grief and from bitterness through his providential provision. God is sovereign over the universe. He can do whatever he wants, but he chooses to provide through, his, through providence. Um, let's read verses 2 and 3 from chapter 2. 
So once they got settled in Israel, now they still have to provide for themselves. They have to figure out a way to get food. And one of the ways in which God provided in the Old Testament was to tell all the farmers of Israel one thing. He said, when you harvest your fields, anything that falls to the ground, you are to leave there. That is for the poor, pe- for the poor people. In fact, the edges of your fields, you are not to touch. You leave them and don't harvest those because those are for the poor people. And so it, what, what poor people could do is go and work and walk behind the harvesters and they would glean it's called gleaning they would grab whatever fell to the ground and that was theirs for them to provide for themselves and so here's what we're going to pick up verse 2 and Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor Naomi said to her go ahead my daughter so she went out um, entered a field and began to glean behind the harvesters and here's what I want you to do, to, to notice, as it turned out. It's like, this could be just a coincidence. It could be they just happened to be. But the author wants you to pay attention that something is happening. She was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. What this meant is this was a relative of theirs. And she just happened to be there. Not only that, but God gave Ruth grace in the eyes of Boaz. So Boaz is an older man, probably the age of Naomi or even a little older. And he asks, who is this young woman that is gleaning behind the harvesters? And they tell them, you know, that she's a Moabite, but that she had compassion on her friend Naomi, on her mother-in-law, and came back with her to help her, you know, provide for themselves. And so she gains grace in front of Boaz. Listen to verse 8 and 9. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field, and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting, and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you, and whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. In other words, you know, the world is a dangerous place. We, we are so blessed, right? We have a police force. We have justice and a system that provides justice, even though it's not perfect. But the world can be a dangerous place. You know, can you imagine a young woman on her own trying to go work in fields where sometimes you don't see people and miles around and what could happen to that woman? And Boaz is just like, hey, don't go anywhere else. I told my men, they can't touch you. And, and you, you're safe here. There's water. You can walk with the women that walk, you know, and work our fields. Just stay with us. And so God provides not only food, but now a safe place where she can be provided for. And if you keep reading, you're going to find out they do lunch together. Everybody kind of that's harvesting does lunch. And Boaz gives her a portion. And Ruth eats as much as she can because she's probably hungry. And she's filled and still has leftovers. And when she takes the leftovers to her mother-in-law, here's what she says. Verse 20. Chapter 2, verse 20. The Lord bless him. Bless Boaz, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. And then she says about the Lord, for the Lord has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. And this is the first time that an old, bitter woman has a glimmer of hope again in her life. I want you to just see and listen to her words. She's starting to see life just a little bit different again. That God still shows his kindness to the living and the dead. And she says, that man is our close relative. He's one of our guardian redeemers. So a guardian redeemer was a person... In Israel, like I told you, women depended on men to do all the transactions in society. So a guardian redeemer was a person that would take this field that belonged to Elimelech or whatever property or land they had in Bethlehem, and he would claim it, but he would give it to the sons of Elimelech as descendants of him, whatever offspring they had. And so in order to do this, he had to take and care for the widows of the family, in this case, Naomi and Ruth. And so we're going to see how God is just providing one, you know, time after another for both Ruth and Naomi. And he just guides them. And here's what what we're going to see next. God is going to redeem Naomi from bitter grief through his exuberant compassion. Let's go through the rest of the story. 
not only did God lead Naomi and Ruth to Boaz, which by the way, you know what the name Boaz means? Strength. It's like, I just want you, you know, it's hard for, you, for us to picture, but God is guiding you just to get to the places where you need to be to gain enough strength in life. And, and, and even though you have better circumstances or painful circumstances, he is, with this providence, he's guiding you to these places where you can gain strength. But then he also shows his exuberant compassion. So let's go through the rest of the story of the book of Ruth. So once Naomi finds out that Boaz is actually a guardian redeemer, a person that can redeem their property and provide for them, she asked Ruth uh, to go through this tradition. And at the time of the harvest, all the people, all the workers, including you know, the far- farmer, the main owner of the farm, would sleep outside. Why? Because all the rain was left outside. And what would happen if they would go inside? Someone would steal it. And so they would sleep outside. And so ne- uh, Naomi tells Ruth, once he's sleeping, here's what you need to do. You need to go and lay at his feet. And there's no sexual connotation, by the way, in this. And you just uncover his feet. And if he throws the blanket and just kind of tell him, hey, you are our guardian redeemer. You can take Naomi's property and land and then care for us and, you know, gain that. Uh, then if he throws his blanket over you, then that means that he's willing. And then you know that he's going to try to redeem us. And so she goes and does that. And Boaz says, I'm willing to redeem you and Naomi. But there's, there's one thing. There's a closer relative to Naomi that has basically the right to redeem you first. And so I need to talk to him. So the next morning, Boaz goes to the, to the city and to the elders of the city. And he tells the other redeemer, whose name we don't know. And he says, hey, there's this, this property that was left of Elimelech that died in Moab. And now Naomi and Ruth are here. And you can redeem it, but you have to care for them. And I don't know if this person wasn't wealthy enough or whatever, but he says, I don't want to do it. And so Boaz turns around and says, okay, I will redeem them then. And that's where we're going to pick up in verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 13. And here's what we're going to find out. Um, so Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Now, we're going to find, in this verse, we find one other trouble that Naomi and Ruth were carrying. Another grief that they had in their heart. Right? So the Bible tells us that these two daughters-in-law were married to Naomi's sons for 10 years. But yet they had zero kids. And for those of you who have struggled with uh, just infertility, you know how painful that can be. And these two women have been carrying the scars of that for so long. But here's how compassionate God is. Not only did he provide for them uh, just a way to eat and to survive. Not only did he provide and led them to the right man's field so that he could redeem them. Now he's blessing both Ruth and Naomi with uh, someone that can inherit everything. With, you know, he, the Bible says the Lord enabled her to conceive. And here's what verse 14 says. And the women in this passage kind of represent the wisdom of, of, of the author. Here, the women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. You know what's interesting? First of all, they didn't let Naomi name this child again. It's like, weakling and and sickly is not going to cut it. So it says the women named the child Obed, which means servant of God. But not only that, they... They see God's compassion. They see God's love, God providing for them. It gave this, this bitter woman, this woman you know, that had been stricken by, by grief, just a second chance in life. God is so good to her that provides someone who is going to inherit everything that they had worked for, her and her husband. And so uh, they, they really are able to receive that. 
here's something else what, that, that I want you to know. The word redeemer in the book of Ruth appears 22 times. And this is a short book. It's four chapters, 85 verses. So there's something about this word that I think the author wants us to wrestle with. He, has, he wants you to ask a question. Who is the redeemer in the book of Ruth, in this story? Now, you know, it can be several people, right? When you read the book, you can say Boaz is the redeemer, right? He's the farmer. He's the rich guy. He's the hero. Like that would be the American, you know, kind of the American thought. Like he's the redeemer. Maybe, maybe it's Ruth. You know, here's this woman that didn't have to go back with her mother-in-law. She probably could have back, gone back to her, her father and lived under his care. Decides to go into a foreign land. She, customs she doesn't know. She may not even be accepted. She's a Moabite, right? They're at war with each other. Maybe she's the redeemer. Some people may say, Obed is going to be the redeemer. Here's the grandson that's going to be able to inherit everything and provide for them down the road. I think if you back up a little bit, what the author is really wanting you to see, that there is a God that we don't see. We don't see him maybe physically, but providentially he's providing a redeemer for us. God provided Jesus as guardian redeemer. In fact, God was so good to Ruth and Naomi that he said, he took this Moabite woman that didn't belong. He took this woman stricken by grief and bitter, you know, and he says, I'm going to make you a part of the genealogy of the greatest king of Israel, King David. But not only that, I'm going to make you a part, if you read the New Testament, of the genealogy of the greatest king of all, King Jesus. And I'm going to make you a part of it. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to grab the last piece of chocolate, if you still have one, and a uh, coffee bean. And you're going to eat them together. You know, I think if you ask most of us, 10 times out of 10 times, you would pick the chocolate piece over the coffee bean. And I know what you're thinking. There are some of you coffee lovers, no, I would pick the coffee bean. But in life, 10 times out of 10 times, we would pick the joyful moments over the sad ones. We would pick laughter over sorrow. You would pick success over failure. But I want you to know God is working through both of them. God is in the, in the midst of both of them. And so we need to understand that, that every time you go through sorrow, you're tempted to become bitter, but you need to understand that God is guiding your life. That sometimes your life may be pleasant and sometimes it may be bitter and sometimes bittersweet, but his goal is to reveal himself through all of those moments to get you closer to him. Naomi, Naomi's journey takes her from emptiness and grief to full, the fullness of God's redemption. God has provided Jesus to give us fullness of life if you accept him. He wants you to know that even in the darkest seasons of your life, Jesus is going to be with you, providing a way, you know, giving you the stubborn love of others, giving you his providential just provision around you, giving you and showing you exuberant compassion. And when you realize that and pay attention to those things, you're going to realize that God is orchestrating a beautiful story through the sweet, through the bitter, so that Naomi may not be Mara again, they may not be bitter again, but may realize of the sweetness of her relationship with God. And that story is a God that we can live as well. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for uh, your compassion for your people, Lord. You know that we live in a broken and a world that is marred by sin. But Father, we trust that you are always just carving a story for us, writing a story that glorifies you, but that is good to us. And Lord, I pray that you give us the faith and the hope and the trust in you to be able to walk the journey that you're set before us, that we would not become bitter, that we, we, that we would understand, Lord, that you are walking right in those moments with, with us, Lord. And let that lift us up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.